Okay, so uh, welcome everyone uh, for this new session of uh, AI, AI for Good. Um, this uh, session is going to be uh, recorded. So it's my uh, pleasure to have uh, Alfred Spector today, uh, Dr. Alfred Spector. Uh, so who's going to talk about uh, data science and you know, like, uh, how, how to do it uh, uh, effect effectively. Uh, so it is. This is based on some uh, lectures that uh, that um, uh, Alfred has given at MIT. I think it's a series of fifteen lectures, and you probably find it on his uh, website too. And also based on a recent book that uh, uh, published in uh, with uh, Cambridge University Press. Uh, the book is called Data Science in Context: a Foundations, Challenges, and Opportunities. Uh, so the um, and, you know I encourage you to uh, to to read this uh, this book. I, I've done it, no, no, not all of it, but uh, the main the, the main chapters. Uh, so to introduce uh, who's uh, Alfred. So Alfred uh, has a dis had a distinguished career in uh, in the computer science and uh, and um, uh, more recently in uh, in finance. He so has been uh, in a leadership positions at IBM, at uh, Google, and uh, uh, now he's uh, as you'll see on his. Uh, a very distinguished uh, resume. He has received many awards. He's a fellow of the ACM and the IEEE. He's a member of National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Science. Right. So he's really uh, uh, he's just missing a Nobel Prize, and then it'd be uh, the, the the perfect resume. Um, that won't happen. <laughs> the so uh, and also so he's a uh, he's uh, he received his uh, bachelor's uh, from uh, Harvard University. And his PhD in computer science uh, from uh, from Stanford. So we are very lucky to uh, to to have him uh, to have him today. And um, so I'm going. So so please uh, please start, Alfred, and you can. You know, add okay, well, I mean, thank you very much for having me. It's nice to talk uh, to all. I can't see you because most of you don't have your camera uh, muted, but I presume you're there. Um, I will tell you that it was much better when I was presenting as a young faculty member with no awards, because then I could usually exceed the expectations of the listeners in my classes and, uh, and my audiences. And now I'll never, I'll never live up to the, uh, to, the, to the reputation. So it's actually quite sad. I, uh, I wish I were starting over again. Any case, um, it is really a pleasure to talk with you. These days, I am a visiting scholar at MIT. I'm a senior advisor at Blackstone, uh, where I'm talking to you from Blackstone today in Manhattan. And uh, I also um, try to serve the nation in some capacities. I'm on the Defense Science Board, and I do some other things uh, trying to keep the ship of state afloat. Uh, this talk, however, is really the basis of, uh, is really um, uh, the basis of my thinking on how to apply data-driven artificial intelligence or data science effectively, um, it, it does come out of um, many years of uh, thinking and leadership and trying to do it, as you say, for good in this meetup, but, but really effectively is a term you could equally well use such that you get uh, appropriate benefits from it. I had a lot of experience with this at Google uh, for eight years leading uh, all of Google research globally when we launched products like speech recognition that finally began to work well enough that people use them regularly or Google Translate was launched under my watch and a number of other things. And even earlier at IBM, when we created the basis for IBM winning Jeopardy. So uh, I've had a lot of experience with the data side after moving from really a more pure computer science background initially. So um, the book, um, which is, uh, sort of the basis of this uh, talk, um, really with my co-authors, Peter Norvig, uh, who uh, wrote maybe the leading artificial intelligence book uh, or co-authored that book, uh, and uh, Jeanette Wing, who started the Columbia Data Science Institute, and Chris Wiggins, um, who is the uh, chief data scientist at the New York Times and a professor of applied math at Columbia, we tried to capture the kinds of lessons that we had all learned and trying to apply data-driven 
technologies, whether you call them data science or I will get to that in a little while, uh, effectively. So what I'll try to do is summarize briefly our thinking um, in about 50 minutes, uh, 45 minutes in this talk. So it'll go kind of fast, but realize you can always um, get access to the book. The book you can buy on Amazon, or lest this seem like too much of a commercial, you can download the um, you know, the uh, the actual text of the book uh, from the website that should be in front of you if you see a chart in front of you. Uh, you can download the author's uh, PDF uh, that we submitted to the publisher. It's very similar to the book. All right, so uh, in part one of the talk, let me just provide a little bit of background. Um, in part two, um, what I'm going to do is I think sort of the main part of the talk is uh, talking about our rubric or checklist saying, if you think of these seven sets of issues, you will do better at actually getting a good result from data-driven technologies. And we'll go through those in more detail. However, even if you think through the rubric, um, there are going to be trade-offs. Um, and everyone's talking about ethics these days. Uh, you'll hear from me, that isn't all that we need to think about. We need to think about economics. We need to think about political science. We need to think about history. We have to have lessons that are considerably broader than just those of the ethicists, which I think is really an oversimplification of what we need to do to keep the world moving forward. And I'll discuss that. I'll even give you a reference to a brand new paper that I've written. If you stick around, you can scan a, a QR code and get reference to a paper that I think will be published in the communications of the Association for Computing Machinery uh, making this argument, uh, it, it should be published within the next six months, I think. And then we'll brief, very briefly discuss societal concerns and policy, but there'll be almost no time for that. So look, what, what is data science about? So everyone, I think, would agree it's about extracting value from data. Um, and there are really two things with data science, and we'll think about this vis-a-vis -vis AI in a minute. One is we're trying to help give people insight. So we're doing things, whether it's statistics or graphing or visualization or whatever, help people make decisions. So for example, in the worlds of investment, in, uh, we're trying to give people the data that are making decisions to buy or sell stock or under, you know, create a portfolio, things of that form, when they're humans that are doing it. And many, many, say, investment firms use humans uh, to go do all this. Data science is still critical. On the other hand, um, data science is also used to automatically generate conclusions. And that's what we usually think about when we think about artificial intelligence. So what are the conclusions? Well, we're predicting something, we're recommending something, we're clustering similar elements, even if we don't know exactly what they are, but we know they're similar in some sense, like spam. Um, we're classifying elements that is not only clustering them, but giving them a name. So like photos with the names of the people that they refer to. Uh, we're transforming information from one form to another. So we might be taking musical signals and turning them into some understanding of whether it's soothing or, um, or not. We may be transforming language in English to language in Chinese. Um, and then we're optimizing. We're trying to find optimal routes or optimal portfolios or the best molecular structure uh, for something, et cetera. So I think those are the main types of conclusions. There may be more in the fullness of time that people come up with, but that's a pretty good set. Now, um, how does that compare to, to AI? And I think broadly, um, AI focuses on conclusions, as I said, data sciences, conclusions, and providing we human beings with insight. Um, AI is typically focused on techniques, right? We could read, I don't know, hundreds of papers per week now, probably being published on new ways of doing generative models, very specific techniques with optimization and scale of models and number of hyperparameters, and et cetera, et cetera. ML is very much also, um, data science is also that, but also statistics, visualization, and other kinds of things that are um, that, that that we don't usually think about in the AI world so much. AI might not always be data driven. Uh, we're not sure. I would say that the verdict is out still. While data driven techniques have certainly dominated all of the progress, or almost all of the progress now since 2000, I would say um, ML has dominated AI. Uh, it may not always be true, and we'll have to see the extent to which. 
there'll be other ways that we generate AI. But data science, of course, is data driven. And then in policy, um, traditionally, data science has had greater near term impact than the AI field. So there's been a lot of discussion on policy, for example, with data collection and such. That's now becoming relevant in AI as we're looking at using generative models everywhere and people wondering you know, what's happening to their data. Uh, so um, that's sort of the brief discussion, but you can see why there's an, a lot of overlap. Now, one of the things, if you're a computer scientist is, you know that computing has been sort of a dominant factor in data science. Uh, it's been really an interesting ride. For those of you that are younger uh, in this audience, it's sort of obvious that computing is kind of an empirical discipline. But when I was a PhD student or an undergraduate, there was essentially none of that. Uh, computer science was an engineering discipline uh, based on abstraction, encapsulation, and reuse. And it was certainly a mathematical discipline in the analysis of algorithms or complexity theory, but there was almost no empiricism in it. And if you look at what happened from 1950, when Turing actually did begin to mention maybe computers could learn from data, he wrote a little bit about it, just a tiny bit. And then in 1955, Samuels began to play around with a learning program that could learn to play chess, et cetera, through Rummel Hart and, and Hinton, the beginning of neural networks in the, in the 80s, et cetera. The field has really moved in that direction. So everything is becoming data-driven. So it's why it's, a, it's such an interesting transformation of this field uh, that didn't start out that way. Um, Turing uh, did mention in this, in this paper here that he wrote in 1953, um, near where the blue arrow is on the screen, um, he's talking about if you're playing chess with other people uh, and learning from the games, uh, which is very much what, say, uh, DeepMind has done uh, with their Alpha um, uh, Go and other related um, technologies for Go and chess and such. All right, so um, another thing, of course, that that happened is that we had scale, right? So we all know the scale is huge um, and, and bigger, you know, just, you know, when you think of, we're sort of used to it, but Google is doing five, 10 billion uh, searches per day. It's an incredibly large amount of work. As we think about, just as an example, we think about using generative techniques in search. We know the generative techniques are expensive. Well, when you multiply it by 10 times 10 to the ninth, it's really quite expensive. So a lot of the complexity and, and all of this stuff is really the scale in it. What made the scale work, and this is a number you may not know, is that Moore's law over 60 years, roughly my lifetime, has resulted in a 40 trillion fold effect on the price performance of computers. So the performance of a computer for a particular amount of money is now 40 times 10 to the 12th better. So it's really amazing. All of you are undoubtedly in our field, if you're on this call, we're really lucky. I mean, it's really an amazing win behind our back that we have something that has never happened in any other technological domain ever to get a 40 times 10 to the 12th wind behind our back, which has made so much of this uh, possible. Um, really quite, quite remarkable. You can do the math yourself uh, to see how you get 40, 40 trillion number. To put things in perspective, we're all terrified, I think appropriately so, of hydrogen bombs. But hydrogen bombs are only measured in 10 to the, not, 10 to the uh, megatons, 10 to the seventh terms. This is 10 to the 12th or 40 times 10 to the 12th. So it's a really big impact on the world. And the results have been very positive, right? With speech recognition, which when I was young was a grand challenge problem. We didn't know how to solve it or translation, uh, search. Um, and and now, now we use them. I, my wife almost never types on her cell phone. She dictates everything. So uh, we see lots and lots of, uh, of successes in this. Um, however, we should be very cautious. So just looking at a data science application, imagine that you uh, were like me and you said, I want an illustration for a book and I'm gonna gather some data, which seems to be quite reasonable to show that vaccination works during a time of COVID. So it should have been clear that by um, uh, 2021, that, uh, that we could measure the mortality 
uh, from COVID in the United States. That was a place where we were doing it, I would say, relatively honestly and consistently across states. Um, and we knew the amount of vaccination, and that was published very, very carefully in the New York Times, um, both numbers. So it was possible to gather data and produce a chart which looked at mortality rates by state at a particular point in time as a function of the amount of vaccination. So we would all hope that if you look at that curve, that the more vaccination, the more you go up in vaccination along the horizontal axis, the lower the mortality, right? That's a really nice thing that we all, I believe it's true, and we wanted to believe, and we would have loved data to just convince everyone that had vaccine hesitancy that this was a good idea. So what I did was for our book, as I started looking at four different time series, which you see in blue, green, um, yellow, and orange, and you see a, a down into the right slope on a couple of the curves, and the other is not so obvious. And what I think is worth thinking about is what a really poor graphic this is, and what a poor idea that I had, even as a reasonably senior data scientist. This is a terrible way of showing what I wanted to show because the, uh, there are all sorts of other effects. Um, there, was, there were waves of COVID that started in one state and got to other states later. COVID varied over time. The age of populations in different states varied. So there were other effects beyond vaccination. And I could go on with about 10 of them. So what I thought was going to be a really good example of visualization for a textbook actually turns out to be a really good example of why you should be very careful to not, re not believe graphs that you might see that purport to prove things. And in fact, it's one of the biggest problems with AI and data science is that it will be used to pur purportedly used to show all sorts of things that just are not true. So we have a much stronger reason to be skeptical in the face of data today than we actually would think uh, in this. Um, so moving forward, um, the good news is this is going to be everywhere in the economy. If you enumerate all the sectors of the US economy, which the National Bureau of Economics Research does uh, in order to break down the contributions of different sectors uh, of the economy uh, to our total gross domestic product, and this would be true in, in every country around the world, you can divide it up in a partition of agriculture, forestry and fishing and mining and utilities and so forth. And it, didn't, it wouldn't be hard for each of you to think of many applications of AI and data science to each one of these domains. So, this is one page of them, there's another page, and that's all there is. This is the entire US economy you've seen go forward in front of you. This is all roughly $30 trillion worth of GDP in the United States. And there isn't anything in it, there isn't one domain where our technologies of data science and AI will not have huge impacts. And that's of course the reasons why everyone is so focused on this today. Um, it took me probably no more than one hour to create this chart once I got the, the list of elements of the sectors of the economy. So it's really quite, quite an impressive uh, uh, opportunity that we have. And again, to go back to the title of this, we're not playing anymore. This is serious stuff, and we have to do it well. We have to do it effectively. We have to do it for good. So now, how do we do that? So. Uh, Briefly, um, I think that we need more of, a, if you will, an architecture to think about how to apply this. It's not just hit or miss. It's not just, hey, I can go generate some correlations and throw them out there and see what happens. I think we can do better than that uh, now. So what we start with is a notion of a rubric saying, these are the seven elements you need to think about if you are going to build a data science application, either for insight or for uh, conclusions, that works. So um, you'll see the list here. Um, first is, is there tractable data? Second is, can you build a model for it? Not everything can be modeled, right? We know that. There's reasons to believe that 
Not everything is, is predictable. Um, there are certain dependability characteristics, which we'll go through in more detail. So should people rely on this? Can they rely on it? Or will we do more damage than good by building something that doesn't meet people's expectations and have the right risk profiles? Must we provide understanding to people? Or is it a black box completely OK? Um, and go into that in more detail. Do we even know what we're trying to achieve? And I would argue that this is one of the biggest problems in many of the societal applications is there is no agreement among us, even in my own family, uh, my own siblings who are educated similarly to me as to what we're trying to achieve uh, in the objective, say on content moderation uh, in, in a system. Um, is, an app, is the application tolerant of failure to begin with? If it's not, much more difficult to use essentially stochastic methods to make them work. Um, so matters of life and death are rather tricky with this. And then there are longer term legal and societal implications we need to think about. And we'll talk about the ethical balancing a little bit later. So we developed this rubric by inducing it. Well, we say we developed the rubric by, we, by inducing it from six examples. Uh, we kind of figured out the rubric from years of work in the field, but six examples illustrate where it comes from. So take spelling correction, which is my very favorite application of data science, now AI, you, whatever techniques you want to use. What are you doing with it? So to just explain the definition, well, we might classify words as either misspelled or correct. If they're misspelled, you draw a little line under it, a little red line like I did on the word misspellings, which is misspelled. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. You might make a recommendation saying, did you mean this? And now increasingly systems are so good that we sort of really know with very high likelihood what the user wants and we can auto-correct or transform. So that's an explanation of what we're trying to do. There are many models, right? There are many ways of doing it. There are dictionary approaches, uh, there are all sorts of approaches we used a few years ago. I'm sure we're using generative models, at least if we can afford to use them. The learning is very fast. Um, I remember thinking back when Barack Obama burst onto the national scene, how many people really knew how to spell Barack? But um, one new use per million with a user self-correcting it would generate 6,000 training examples a day on a search engine like Google's. So you learn in just minutes how to, how to spell Barack if you didn't know. Um, and it's a valuable application with practically no downsides. There are some. It's tricky. You have to be careful like to not divulge secrets. So, you know, if I type my, you know, secret password into Google, you don't want it to like start spelling correction, all similar things to that password. That would be a bad thing to go do. So you don't want to learn Alfred, secrets. Alfred, in, a, yeah. in your book, I think you have an excellent example about uh, with Facebook imparting a contact list. I think then, uh, so you will enter the name and then the Facebook will autofill the phone number. So hackers would, I think this was an excellent uh, thing I didn't know. Right, that was a very good example, right? That's, that's a more, um, it's a more uh, sensible example than the one I gave you that it, that actually happened in real life. So. In security, which I personally, I've also led many security teams over the years, I find computer security the hardest problem in computer science because they're so complicated to try to think through every subtle issue that can occur. But this is a relatively okay example. Um, I will say though that, you know, if you go back to the writings of Plato, um, Plato argued that uh, the written word made us stupid because you didn't have to memorize them. So, you know, in the days of Homer, who memorized the Odyssey and Iliad and could recite, you know, for hours and hours, these stories of Odysseus and Troy and Agamemnon and Helen and such, um, the written word was a crutch. And it is true when we have all sorts of written things, we don't have to re-derive things for our audience. We can just read them. So there's some truth to that. My opinion is with spelling and I, challenge anyone to tell me otherwise, I think spelling teaches us to spell. And I am at least personally much more willing to use words 
that I don't know how to spell and learn them than I would if I had to actually pick up a dictionary and look at it. So I think it's actually a very good application. It's my, it's still my favorite. Uh, speech recognition is also a very good application, much harder. And the only thing I'll comment on is that um, it, it's a transformation application and we didn't really know how to do it. I mean, the issue was unlike spelling correction, we had a continuing stream of techniques to do it starting, I don't know, when computers started, it was really easy to start with it. Uh, speech recognition was truly hard. So, but but it's a, a very good application as well. Again, many privacy issues, for example, when you're, if you're trying to get training data from speech and you have contractors that are listening to speech and then generating transcriptions to learn from, this generated all sorts of controversy, probably correctly so, uh, in the privacy community early on. Um, and it, it does illustrate the issue of if you have private data, can you license that private data to a contractor to work on, even if it's going to benefit the system at large and no one really is attempting to get your personal information? Um, music recommendations or recommendations in general are a very interesting example. For example, in the, the models that frequently are used, they're um, ensembles of many things, collaborative filtering so that you can understand what others like and how that might affect you based on similar others to you. Uh, knowledge of, uh, of musicians and connections between musicians, musical genres and periods of time that can be easily learned from information or gathered from, from uh, music dictionaries or Wikipedia and the like. And of course, transformation, audio signal processing, so that you can transform the timbre of something into into some understanding, understandable thing and, and, and select similar kinds of music. Um, all aspects of data science uh, are part of it to do this recommendation. You're predicting and clustering and classifying and optimizing and such. And it's not the same in every service. For example, in the early days of recommendations of videos, Netflix would recommend videos that they had that were cheap and Amazon would recommend videos that were more expensive, didn't care because you were paying for them in the early days and Amazon made a cut of the action. So they did a completely different set of objective functions uh, of, what, uh, of what they were trying to achieve financially. And that's converged more with Amazon Prime and, and Netflix subscriptions being more similar now. Um, protein folding is a scientific advance. Um, very interesting um, topic that could uh, perhaps revolutionize um, intelligent drug design and make it possible to build drugs that are far uh, more efficacious, uh, lower side effects and, and such things. Um, very difficult problem. Um, it's uh, unclear, it's not exactly clear we've solved it yet. There's a paper on the website datascienceincontext.com, so the name of the book data science and context.com in the uh, sort of supplemental materials. One of my students wrote a paper. She's going to, um, to DeepMind to work uh, with the researchers there. And she wrote a paper of what's still not understood in protein folding for my class. And uh, we decided to publish it on our website. Um, healthcare records, some of you I'm sure must be involved in this. It's so obviously, uh, seemed to be so obviously perfect for trying to gather information from the collective experience of millions or hundreds of millions of people that we could learn a ton from it and understand why drugs work in some people and not others and the nature of disease and prevention and, and really lower costs, but it's very difficult to go do. Uh, data is not comparable in many places. The privacy implications are overwhelming. The cost, the legal uh, legal uh, uh, regulation makes risk extremely high uh, and the like. So very interesting uh, sets of challenges in that. Um, it's, uh, I, I have a little bit more on this, but you know, I'm always shocked to see the articles that say, oh, gee, all these 80 year olds that are exercising a lot are doing really well. And of course, is it correlation or causation? Uh, and uh, as an older person that runs, I don't know if it's the running that's allowed me to grow old somewhat gracefully or whether it's just luck because I've grown old gracefully. I like to run a lot. Uh, the best example was estrogen replacement uh, therapy uh, for women. Uh, there was a study done 
um, a retrospective study done in Framingham, Massachusetts of nurses. And the nurses at the time uh, were, uh, some of them got um, estrogen replacement therapy uh, to um, reduce the risk of heart disease and had other beneficial effects as well. And others didn't, and uh, others didn't. And when you looked back at it, uh, it was not randomized. Um, the ones who got estrogen replacement therapy had a lower risk of heart disease. And it made complete sense because heart disease in women begins around menopause to, to grow rapidly. And that's when there are changes in estrogen levels. So it seemed to make complete sense. And then when you did a, um, a placebo controlled uh, uh, prospective trial, the effect went away. And it turned out it was almost certainly a confounder. That is the women who got estrogen replacement therapy either were more health conscious or had more money or better doctors or something. And they did better uh, than the women who didn't. And in fact, it's been enormously up in the air whether this is a good idea or not because of other side effects. So I, I think the point of it is, I think we should all be humble. I'm sure I would have made the same mistake if I had been leading the study. I, I would have fallen into that same trap of saying, boy, it seems absolutely the case. This has got to be true. Let's go, let's go solve growing heart disease for uh, postmenopausal women. And I would have, I would have screwed it up. Uh, so lots of lots of challenges with healthcare. Um, the last example is a COVID mortality prediction, uh, which was for anything longer than a couple of weeks out, a complete failure. Um, uh, there were 50 models, a paper was written to the credit of, of the modelers. They wrote a paper looking at a bunch of models that were developed uh, in 2020, the first year of COVID. And um, they found that half the models did a little bit better than a naive model, which predicted COVID the next day would be the same as it is today. Uh, and half the models did worse. And you would think that the best models would be really sophisticated with vast amounts of data and understanding of the dynamics of transmission, et cetera. They weren't. Simple models did, uh, did fine. And it was ultimately an ensemble of all the models that was best, but none of them could predict uh, COVID outbreaks a few weeks uh, hence. And you know what? It should give us a lot of uh, understanding in, um, in uh, humility because it's not really predictable. The disease was changing. We didn't understand it. Governors could wake up in the morning and tell everyone to stay home or tell everyone not to stay home. And it would be completely impossible to predict. So I think what you might get from all this is, do you have the data? For example, with COVID, it was impossible to get very fine grain location data of when say Min and I were at the same restaurant sitting at a table talking loudly to each other. That data was unacceptable to get in the United States for privacy reasons if, and others as well. So think about the difference of that tractable data in that versus say advertising data where we know clicks and such on a web, which is very fine grain and rather intimate. Um, technical approach. Um, for many things, there is one, but for other things, um, we don't know what a governor is going to go do in the morning. Right, we can't predict uh, the actions of a single individual, which has a very big effect. And markets, um, it's extremely difficult in uh, in game theoretic situations to understand all of the levels of uh, change that may occur. Dependability, um, in somewhat more depth, um, can we meet privacy requirements? And there are a number of them. Can we actually secure the system? properly, and that's not just for data, but will it run correctly in the times that we really need it, or will it be crashed uh, by adversaries? Um, is it abuse resistant? People will try to misuse a system for fun or profit. And abuse resistance, uh, for example, with the Microsoft Tay program uh, was a huge problem for Microsoft and its reputation for many years. Uh, and uh, Facebook has had that issue. It's a huge amount of engineering to build public facing systems that are abuse resistant. And finally, is it resilient against unknown challenges that we might have? Again, humility uh, needs to be there. And understandability, there are three aspects to it. So first is, can we explain a result? So 
we are putting a stock portfolio together like this, and here's why it will generate better returns for you. Or do we not know? And do we expect our investors just to say, well, Min wrote the book on AI and finance, it's got to be right, which is possible, but I think they would rather know why. Um, Second, must you show causality? Data science is usually not good at that. Usually requires changes to the physical in the physical world and experimentation to show causality. And then in many realms, you'd like to be able to say, here's the data, here's a model. You reproduce my results. That's the tradition of science going back hundreds of years. But how often can we really give people a freeze-dried snapshot of all of the code in ways that will not change and all of the data and let people actually go at it, usually for privacy or intellectual property or even just the nature that AI algorithms are changing five levels down in some library that's called by some other library that's called by some other library, et cetera. And we don't even know. I think we've talked about objectives, but just what do we mean by fairness? Do we believe in meritocracy? Do we want to govern outcomes? What's going on? And this is a, a case in, in many domains in what we're doing. And I think I've already brought up toleration of failures. Um, societally, um, we need to keep in mind these issues. Um, if we're going to like hollow out the workforce, eventually, if we try to go do that um, without thinking about it, will be regulated, or will be banned. It won't work. You already saw in the state of California that um, California has so far banned the use of self-driving trucks without a truck driver. And it was because of a labor union that said, we don't, we don't want this. Truck driver jobs are uh, very well paid and they're very well organized. Um, there are in endless legal issues now on a state by state level and of course across different countries that say we'll get to ethics. So um, the rubric looks like this. Um, uh, Min, you were very nice to say that you could apply this out of the box. And I, I think so. And um, it doesn't mean that everything's a waterfall method. You figure out all this first. But this is what you keep in mind uh, when you're doing things. And, and I, I can give you an example. At Google, um, you know, there was a, a time when we felt we could use um, the Google search um, history to go uh, look at um, uh, uh, the gross domestic happiness level, the overall state of mind of the US populace and probably populations all around the world. And that's an interesting thing because gross domestic product is not necessarily the thing you want to optimize a society for. But then when you think about it, you look at it and say, well, people are going to want to understand why, right? If we give them a mechanism, people if we if we give them a result, it's so important to the political system, are people happier or less happy, that they're going to want to know why. So you're going to have to have explanation. But if you have explanation, you're going to be subject to abuse. Because it's so important, people are going to want to manipulate the results to show that the population is happier. So those two things, we decided not to pursue the project, even though the search history could actually show that, but not in a way that would be useful and beneficial to the world because it would fall apart uh, under just those two rubric elements. And many things don't work in that way. So if you look at generative AI, if you're not failure tolerant, um, probably the application is not quite right yet until we do better with loose nations. All right. Um, the book goes through many examples, which I'm not going to go through. Um, I'll just, I'll like show you uh, uh, just a, one of them uh, here. Um, if you look at, you know, in session video game personalization, the second row of this, um, there's a lot of data, right? We know what all the users are doing in a video game. We're recording everything. Um, we certainly have an approach, right? We could see people, you know, beginning to lose interest, they're responding less quickly to the game, so we could perhaps make the game more interesting to them if we wanted to. Um, it could be abused uh, by others that are, you know, playing the game and trying to confuse the system. Probably don't have to show understandability, uh, but the objectives are tricky, right? Is our goal to keep people enslaved to a video game 
seven by 24 by 365, or should they go have dinner or study for their exam the next day? Um, so there are ethical and, um, and financial complexities uh, in this. And I think- well, I'll, I'll try maybe to, uh, to explain to the audience. So how, how do you read this table with a check mark or no check mark? So- The check mark means we sort of know what to do. What to do. Right? We, 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 I mean, it isn't necessarily easy, right? Video recommendations are hard to do, but we know how we can do it. The part that's really hard would say video recommendations is it's ambiguous what we want to recommend. That's the really hard part of this. And you can see Washington, you know, like saying, well, we need to do this sort of moderation. No, no, freedom of speech. No, no, right wing. No, no, left wing. You know, and we don't know the objectives. I'd be very surprised that it's very easy to regulate this given our constitution. So uh, that's what these mean. So there, I think there, the chart goes through lots of examples. And I actually, I would never expect a student to study every one of them, but only to study the ones that they might be interested in. Probably people on this uh, this this podcast, this this call, are are interested in certain kinds of things and not others, and they'd find some of them to be interesting analysis. There's text associated with the the table elements in in the book. Uh, so now. Um, let me go to this next section, which I want to do in just five minutes. Um, so the problem is that when you look at what we're trying to do with these systems, um, we have uh, trade-offs and tough decisions. Um, we're dealing with ever harder problems. Uh, second, um, there are very significant impacts of those problems on very large populations now. As I've said, there's no consensus in many cases. And sometimes the technical solution is very hard. So it's different than like the earliest days when someone you know, clicked on baby formula and we put up some baby formula ads. That was pretty easy to do. So uh, here's how I think about how we have to make decisions on what to do. So first is there are technical contributors to um, any technology uh, that we are applying to the world at large. Um, second, we have to be honest. And third, we need to actually be educated humans to think through how to balance ethics, benefits of the financial system, productivity, the impacts on politics, lessons from history and the like. And if we combine those, um, we can be better. So under the technical contributors, I, of course, think of in our field, um, these seven rubric elements. In other fields, if we were structural engineers, we'd be worried about corrosion or hairline fractures. In medicine or, or pharmacology, we'd be worried about side effects and dosing and cost benefit of treatments and the like. But so every field has these specifics, but it's not enough, right? We know there's corrosion on airplanes and we still fly them. It's just we've made a decision that we're willing to pay a certain amount of money to every so many years to excise corroded parts and airplanes are not perfect. There's some, some failures that happen. We make trade-offs. Same thing's true with data science. Okay, um, integrity. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. On the, so the, your, technical ex, uh, your, your technical expert, they're like domain experts, right? They're, they're the technical contributors. But at the same time, these people might end up using your tool, right? Or be users or, or compete with your tool, right? So you talk to doctors. So how do you like reconcile? How, how do you, can you make them like neutral you, so that they get the kind of unbiased input to the model? Using that, you know, this in terms of, you can ask a radiologist, how do you, can, can you make a better like model to, you know, to study radiology? Yeah. But they might understand right. that at the end of the day, it will be competing right. for them. Well, I, it's a it's a great topic. So let's go back to that. I, I will get back to that because you're right, is that it is true we humans are all biased in some way, right? We have a bias. We have a model. You know, we have the same kind of bias an algorithm has, right? If we're trying to fit something to a line, you know, you know, y equals mx plus b, we have a bias, right? We're going to get a straight line no matter what the data is. So there's always a kind of an induction bias uh, in systems, and we humans have it. How do we overcome that is kind of what you're saying, I think. And 
we'll get back to that. So give me a moment. Second thing, though, I think is one thing we can't have, and I just do not accept, and I've always been this way, even when I was a professor, I absolutely do not accept dishonesty. And unfortunately, all of us see every day among essentially all politicians, continual dishonesty. We cannot do that. So we have to disclose our weaknesses, say what we know, what we don't know, and, uh, and, and be absolutely as truthful as we possibly can be in this. And if we don't do that, then uh, like I'm, I, I have zero tolerance in my organizations over the years and in my classes and such. We have to go back to this in our, in our discipline. We're not playing games anymore. We're changing the world. Third, um, now how do we make decisions? So ethical frameworks um, are idealistic, right? We would like that. We, 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 usually they're pretty idealistic. Uh, but then there's economics, right? We're trying to build uh, wealth for people, give people a chance to grow and to make money and to have a better life. More precisely, how do we minimize harm? There's always some risk of harm, but how do we minimize it? And how do we make a system where the benefits are likely to outweigh, outweigh the risks? So we can't just think about maximizing things willy-nilly without considering what the risks might be. And then we'd like to think about where we can, how do we get benefits to accrue across a broad population? And, and the Belmont principles were created for medical research, uh, but we think they apply very broadly. And there are many examples I could give, many things that have been very uh, destructive in politics in the, in the US, like whether to do vaccinations to children or not, actually arise from conflict in these principles. And they're understandable, and we shouldn't be at each other's throats over it because reasonable people could make different decisions based upon the balance of these things. But it's not just the Belmont principles, there are lots of principles. As what's going on in Ukraine today, um, there are the ethics of warfare, jus ad bellum, the, the rules leading up to war, and jus in bello, the laws that govern the activity of war. These have been come about over many, many years in the 1900s, sometimes even before. And it's these principles that enable us to conclude um, uh, issues about what's right and what's wrong in the prosecution of this war, including the fact that it shouldn't have been prosecuted because it violated um, uh, the need to exhaust peaceful means. Uh, war is supposed to be a last resort. Uh, and it was not, and there are many other aspects of it as well. So uh, there are many kinds of ethical principles, and there are more John Stuart Mill, Kant, um, what do we mean by fairness? There's even more than that. I keep learning more all the time. However, um, if all we taught is our students and we thought about it ourselves, we'd forget we're here in much aspects of a capitalist, almost any society where we wanna build things which generate surplus. So we're trying to generate surplus and we're trying to balance how activities that we do increase the economic well-being of a society. How do, how do we govern? What's the role of, of, of pluralism and governance? And we need to see when things don't work in the past. If we try to regulate everything in a certain direction, things often blow up and people rebel. And we've seen that, I think, in the US political system in certain ways. So um, I, I argue we need to look at a bunch of things. Now, how do you do that? Uh, and that gets back to your question, Min, is what management mechanisms are needed to achieve the proper attention and balance of challenges, profit, et cetera? So everyone in an organization, the sales team wants to maximize sales revenue, probably. That's what they tend to do. And um, if you have a privacy team, they want to absolutely minimize the likelihood of any possible privacy risk uh, whatsoever. That's their objective, and et cetera. And you have many, many different sets of objective functions with many, many uh, applications of data science, particularly in organizations with more than one person. So uh, what are the management mechanisms needed to achieve proper attention and balance? I can't go into that, but more or less, um, I think 
you have to have a, a group of em, employees that understand, uh, or contributors that understand integrity. We have to understand the fundamental technical issues. And then we have to understand that there's some mechanism for adjudicating the balance among them. And not everyone will necessarily agree, but we have to agree overall with the objectives of the organization or else we probably shouldn't be there uh, within the organization. So it's a complicated topic um, and uh, there could be a whole one hour discussion on it, but I'd rather not do it. If you're interested in my um, this particular thing, this three-part framework is not in the book, but you can take a picture of this um, of this QR code. And it's a paper that I literally just finished two weeks ago that I believe will be published in the communications of the ACM. It's been accepted with revision and I've made the revision. So I think that means it will be published. It's only about four pages. So it's a lighter read than the book. All right, finally, um, I won't go through more examples uh, except to say, if you look at what's going on in the press and in society, I think you can see that the topics of, in the general list, economics and fairness impacts people and institutions, the personal implications of data, um, institutional and societal operation and governance concerns, the environment and trust, they all arise from these rubric elements in their balance. So um, they, they show up by combining certain rubric elements. So like people are distrustful of systems because you know they don't understand the privacy models they've seen all these security break-ins they don't know who's getting rich from the data they don't know how much how how much wealth is being accumulated it, it shows up right in in fairness they don't really understand the objectives of a system so many of these things are natural and unsurprising to me and what you do about these are also very complex. Um, I will just list some of them here. So are we going to regulate AI with blanket technological regulation? We're gonna regulate AI, create the National AI Regulatory Commission. I think that's a bad idea. Um, a regulation in society is sectoral. So what we do in the financial markets is different than we do on highways with, with cars. And yet AI will be used in both. Um, and that applies to medicine and you name it, right? What we use, what, what we regulate with respect to comedy and uh, the use of, um, you know, I don't know, uh, imagery and comedy is going to be very different uh, than, than in motion pictures or something like this. Um, the, the back plane we have to remember for data science application is above country. So if you really do things that are unique to a firm, a country recognized that if you don't do it for the world, you just move the activities offshore unless you're willing to replicate the great firewall of China for every country. Um, remember, we have limited agreement on objectives. Who decides? Would you like the executive to decide? Then if you were a Bernie Sanders supporter or a Trump supporter, are you happy with that decision, uh, recognizing it could have been either person as the next president? Um, uh, uh, can, I, can I ask you about, uh, so we mentioned um, security or cyber security. Uh, so cyber security is a risk on, you know, like, you know, uh, IT infrastructure is across all sectors, right? Uh, across, you know, the uh, many countries. So how is it, is there any regulation today to address that or that's nothing? Okay. Well, so I think it's, I think it's the hardest thing in the world to regulate because people that are willing to live with the regulations are very likely to be uh, good guys. And it's the bad guys you're worried about. So as of today, there's nothing. There may be some, you know, you have to report that you had a, like a computer breach or this kind of thing, or no, there's a... Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of regulation, but the, the, the issue is that it, it's, it's extremely difficult to, uh, I mean, uh, it, it's a good question. So I suppose we could create in negative incentives for large companies that are so very large that if there is the leak, least cybersecurity problem, we'll, we'll throw them into bankruptcy. We threw the airbag country, the, the Japanese airbag company, into bankruptcy over about 10 deaths 
despite the tens of thousands of life saved from air bats. So if we're willing to do that, we could probably you know, have more security, but then we would have no small companies ever release anything. They would go away because you couldn't do it. And big companies would stop innovating. So it's very difficult to do, I think. Um, where do we want the, the regulation to come from? Uh, many people think it's undesirable for private companies to have a lot of power, but there's a disagreement of whether we think the government will do it better or not. Uh, many people are not sure as to where, what, what's run better, the federal government or Google or Amazon? Um, where do you want that power to be? Uh, regulation is usually very slow and it favors big companies almost always. Yeah, I was mentioning cybersecurity because, because it's not new. Right, because today we could say that okay, data science AI is, is, is new, so nobody really knows how to do it. But cybersecurity is not new, has been around for, for decades or even, even more. Well, look, and it's so, much better than it was. I mean, it actually is in many ways. So um it, it is improving, but it's a very big problem. It's uh I I agree at the challenge. Again, it's another whole topic, another hour-long discussion we could have about what to do. I published the cybersecurity bill of rights. I don't know, 10, 15 years ago in a National Academy thing, and we're well away from knowing how to achieve all of the objectives that we set forth in that. That's an aspirational document of what you'd like to do. Anyway, the other final thing is the, the AI pause letter is an interesting letter that was done. Um, in the Kissinger, Schmidt, and Huttenlocker book, um, they, they already talked about it the year and a half before. And they wrote, attempts to halt its development will merely cede the future to the element of humanity courageous enough to face or benefit from the implications of its own inventiveness. One of uh, two of my students, Kopiak and Struckman, wrote a very interesting paper. Again, it's on my website, datascienceandcontext.com. Uh, they wrote a paper, a 35 page paper, summarizing the of uh, the, uh, the results of a survey of the people that signed the AI pause letter. And I think you'd all find it quite interesting. Um, but more or less, no, essentially no one that signed the AI pause letter thought there would be an AI pause. They were only doing that to just make a point that we should be paying attention to uh, the long term. Well, are they just hedging? They say if something bad happens in the future, they will say, well, we told you. Well, I don't know if they, I don't think my students determined that, but they probably wouldn't have wanted to say that in, the, in writing. So um, there's a lot more in this, but what I've gone through are these topics. I know I used up the full hour and didn't leave time for much discussion. I'm terribly sorry, but I have more time if you, anyone wants to ask me any questions. I'm delighted. Well, I have to a couple of questions and I'll turn it to the, to the, to the floor. Um, in your list, I'm very interested in the, how to uh, to lead like AI AI data science project in organization. So you know in IT, a lot of studies that you know many the majority of big IT projects fail. Right, in the, the statistic that seventy percent or, or more of these uh, big IT projects fail on uh, on uh, or very many yes. people on that. So I suspect that in AI and data science you might have the same kind of statistic. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but so mm -hmm. what would be so far? To avoid failure, so in your list of the seven rubrics, which, is, which, which are like the critical points, or how about the, uh, maybe someone should do a study of like why these data science projects. Well, so there, so I think there are two, two things I can offer. So number one is just as it relates to the AI or data science aspect of it, you have to use um, an appropriate balance in trying to think through the um, uh, complexity of the project. So you don't just like wanna think through every detail. It's not the waterfall method that I endorse by any means, but you have to get deep enough on a few things to know it may work, right? There's enough value. We kind of know the objectives well enough to start that you have to sort of think through the elements. And then you proceed along certain lines and you iterate and go back and forth between things. And I think that level of breadth is important. Look, so many people, I think there's a quote in our book or in the ACMQ paper that everyone wants to do the modeling, right? No one wants to do the data. No one wants to think about the security, but that's where almost all the work's gonna be. 
is in these other issues. So you have to be disciplined enough to think about those. The second aspect of it is that there's always a debate between I want to do the whole project and do it really well. And no, it's not boiling the ocean, even though it seems like it's boiling the ocean, versus trying to what I call factorize the project into a collection of achievable subunits that can be achieved over time and that each sequentially spin off value, enabling an organization to remain committed to the long term goal. So I think as leaders, and any of you that are leaders or will become leaders, try to always remember the long-term goal, right? We're trying to produce robots that will help elderly people as they age, have a better life and you know, live longer at lower cost and reduce health disparities, right? That's a wonderful set of goals. But now factorize those goals into achievable chunks. Because if we have to achieve the big goal, probably we're going to run out of money or the person that was our endorser will change their mind or have a heart attack or something. So factorize our work. And then still, though, keep in mind that these factors, when they're multiplied together, will lead to some wonderful outcome. And um, so in many ways, these, uh, these, and so I don't know if uh, how it was at, at Google and other organizations where you work, but uh, some people would like use like an, a, an agile development framework and they have for instance a product owner, right? That kind of a sponsor or product owner, you know, or business owner of the, of the project. What would be the ideal person to do that? Or, and is it possible? Because some of these, you know, some of the items you have like so many objectives to reach or it's not, uh, it's not clear. So can one product owner like lead the project successfully? Uh, I don't know. That's a hard question. I, I'm not sure I fully heard you because it's a little bit muffled, but I think you said is what's the ideal person to lead a project? I yeah, think yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it it so depends on the project, the team, the leadership of that leader, what that person wants. So it's, you know, if you have a if there's a CEO that's very technology driven and that believes in technology, um you know, you need maybe you need a different person that's less a Pied Piper than you do if you have a, you know, a, a classic, uh, you know, uh, suited uh, MBA leading the project. No offense to them, but, but you know, it's just a different, a different gestalt. Uh, I think it's very specific to the situation. In, in engineering, we can think about exactly the right building blocks we want and build a system. In human systems, we have to recognize that every environment is different and all people are different. So how we assemble the right modules, I mean, people, is going to be very, very, very much a function of our individual individuality. And that's the joy. I've been a manager, I suppose, of about maybe 10, 10,000 people over the years. That's sort of the fun in organizational design. It's, it is different than computer architecture. So there's no good answer. You have to think about it though and say, I'm combining a project management oriented project lead with a technical visionary oriented number two or vice versa. And you have to combine it in a way, but everyone should be thinking about how do I have a North star that I'm trying to achieve, but how do I break it down into achievable components that spin out value and will make sure that we get rewards as we build the product individually, as well as corporate or organizationally or societally, uh, that uh, we then get the efforts. To, uh, the get spirit the of the, the, my, my question. So, do you have any like recommendation in terms of like so how to make the so you have CTO, you know, uh, a successful CTO, so head of a technology organization? You talk about technical contributors, so like domain experts, and uh, so how do you make the so people from technology, people from like the data scientists, because sometimes data scientists are not part of technology, uh, on uh, on then the, the the business side or the domain experts. How do you make them work together so that uh, the project can be successful? Communications. Yes. Yeah. You have I a. Mean, have you talk a bit? I mean, it's very it's very clear that in many organizations, 
people will say, wait a second, what is engineering doing? We just want you to like be able to get data for us and feed it in, you know, at megabytes per second or hundreds of megabytes per second into our system. What are you doing with Kubernetes? Or what are you doing with, you know, this or that or the other thing? How can you need all these people to do infrastructure? Just give us what we want. And it's a very common issue, happens all over the place. Um, the only thing that works are people that are willing to communicate with each other and to explain over and over again what it takes to build a working system. And again, I, I'm maybe being overly uh, self-serving, um, uh, but I think the rubric is helpful. You have to say, look, you have to do all of these things. It's not just about the model. Why did you call it the rubric and not the checklist? Because uh, check, it's like it's, it's like a checklist too, right? So, uh, it is. A, so rubric is a check. I think there is, we, we could have called it a checklist. And if you look at um, the work of Atul Gawande, who's a famous physician uh, and uh, public health uh, expert, um, he believes in this, and 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 we know it for airplanes as well, right? You, no one, I'm sure, there's a pilot on our call somewhere. A pilot does not take off without going through the checklist uh, for her plane. Uh, and that's appropriate. So we're all human. I'm as flaky as anybody, but if I have a checklist, I'm much more likely to get the breadth of things considered. So I think that's uh, important. Let me open it to the floor. So please raise your hand and uh, unmute you. You, you want to ask any questions to Alfred? We I mean, have time to take a few, a few questions there. Silly fun and questions are particularly uh, desirable, but anything is good. Okay, silly and fun. <laughs> yeah, really. Anyone? So I think you can raise your hand. Everyone yeah. is very polite and they're invisible. Yes. Uh, someone, someone tell me where you're from, at least one person, so I know someone's there. Okay, that's Steve. Okay. Uh, okay, I know Steve. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, Steve, I can. Steve, uh, Steve yeah. Winner, Steve. Uh, Steve Winner, uh, I am, uh, I spent the last five years in um, in FinTech at, at uh, an electronic bond trading firm running municipal fixed income. One of the big, big challenges that we have is in, um, in data uh, when it, re when it's, um, relates to state and local governments. And I saw that in, in uh, somewhere on one of your slides where you had mentioned state and local governments. And uh, financial disclosure, there was a, a, a recent um, uh, law that was passed, uh, the Financial Data Transparency Act. And municipalities are going to have to start to report their financials, their continuing disclosure. And everyone is, is sort of, um, um, convinced that it will be through uh, through XBRL, through a portal. I'm just wondering when you have unstructured data and different different entities report in different ways, they call it different things, and there's an enormous amount of mapping uh, that goes into um, trying to categorize these, uh, these things. How, how do you envision AI playing a part in that? And that, that is probably such a broad question that it is silly. It's not a, it's, it's unfortunately not silly. I'd love to be laughing, but I, but I can't. Um, I mean, and it's, I think, isomorphic to the healthcare data problem in the United States as well, uh, because combining data from multiple institutions and different drug trials and such is exactly the same problem. Um, so it's, it seems possible, you, these the generative models to go and produce extracted tables that line up the raw data in ways that look remarkably seductive. And I think that that seems like a labor saving, you know, at least a hypothetical bit of code that they're writing that'll get us our stuff into a, a database or a shared spreadsheet or whatever it might be effectively. But that leaves the problem that you mentioned is the data may not be comparable. Right? Is everyone assuming a month is four weeks, or are they assuming a month is a month, or you know, et cetera? And 
I think the subtlety of that is I don't understand how that gets fixed uh, automatically by these systems. So to me, um, some of the data gathering is going to happen more automatically, but I would think we still have to exercise quite a bit of caution so that we're not comparing things that actually can't be compared or aggregating things. I, but other people, I must admit, I am not the world's expert hands-on on this. I'm not managing a team doing it. I'm philosophizing and that's dangerous. So maybe someone else on the call will tell you that here's a solution to that. And I, I don't know it though. Any thoughts, Stephen, or make sense or? Uh, yeah, okay. You're mutated. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, um, you know, my, my, my initial thought is that this stuff can be mapped. It, it, it gets a little complex when you have, uh, call it uh, 80,000 municipal uh, state local governments and subdivisions right. thereof in the United States. And they call things different things. So one might call it revenue, one might call it uh, sales receipts, one might call it you know uh, something else. Uh, and, and that gets relatively um, sloppy, but yep. that's, that's fixable, I think. It's, it, you can map that stuff where it gets kind of complicated is where one small municipality might uh, include all of its different revenue sources in one fund, whereas uh, a larger municipality divides it into several different funds. And to do those analyses can be, um, you're, you're trying to unbundle all these things that are uh, pre-bundled. And I think that gets sloppy, but uh, I think this is not going to be a small feat. This is no small feat. And, and it's going to be really interesting because it's been mandated that, that um, these, these state and local governments need to start to report in a certain way. And it only becomes useful when market practitioners, credit analysts, the ratings agencies, uh, investors can start to take that data and, and make use of it. So I, I'm, I'm keen to uh, keep a close eye on it. And uh, an offline conversation would be a lot of fun, by the way. So, sure, um, that'd be fine, send me a note. Um, one thing that uh, I also suggest is that when there's a lot of work in something like this and a lot of economic value, as there probably is, uh, both in terms of just as investors, but also in terms of uh, trying to ensure the best practices uh, of individual uh, states uh, and cities and localities, um, there may be some factoring of this with institutions that just go do this work once for everybody. And Agreed. One would, one would think that would happen, right? That there's, if we all have to do it individually, we're a relatively small organization invest, investing in fixed income, that sounds hard. But you know why wouldn't some large data provider do it? You'd think they would. That that's where there would be value. I agree. Uh, yeah, uh, we can we can take it offline. It's a it's a fun conversation, for okay. sure. I, I'm afraid I'm maybe the one last question. So, so I mentioned to you about bias bias of uh, domain experts. So I, maybe I can give you to, uh, to make it clear. I give you an example of uh, of I heard about. Uh, I think it was a, a firm trying to uh, to find a use case of AI in uh, in law firms. Okay, so they did. Uh, they uh, they had two groups. One group they say, "Well, we're going to use AI and find is there any way to uh, make the team more efficient, meaning that we can like, you know downsize the the teams and so on thanks to AI." And the other group they say, "Well, we're going to use AI and we're going to see how." You know, it's going to make you more productive, or you know, a new application and brings more revenue. So they did that, and then at the so they you know they they work on that, and then the two groups came up with the answers. So the group where they were told why the risk of downsizing, they found there's no application of AI. They said we look very hard and we don't find anything. <laughs> the other group where the manager told them why well, you know it make you more productive, you can you know find new opportunities. They find plenty of ideas of applying, of applying AI. Right? So the way you frame, <laughs> so the, the way you work with the technical contributors or the domain experts can really heavily influence their the, the inputs right? or their the, the expertise. Right? So the, 
I found that example very, very striking. I well, it's, that, it's the reason why you have to be extremely careful with this. I mean, it, the advice I give to all of you as fellow members of a society, perhaps voting members, is be extremely careful about the vast amounts of data that we read in newspapers and the press and anything of that form, even within our organization, because the results are almost certainly there's a, some, some, some built-in bias in them. And this isn't a bias against a particular subgroup in society. I don't mean it in that way. There's a bias that could be true too, but, but there's just a bias that has built into it by something in the model uh, that, or the statistical techniques that are used or the survey technique. Um, there's just almost no doubt about it uh, that it will happen. And it's uh, just one, one example, and I'll tell you, I'll finish with this because I think it's it's a, another mea culpa. I'm, I, I, I had some responsibility at Google for providing technologies that would be of value to members of to journalists in the world, and we had a view at Google. Uh, this was between seven and fifteen, roughly two thousand seven and fifteen, that if we provided tools that gave journalists more and more data, they would build data driven articles that would be better. And I regret, I think it's often, if not predominantly backfired, is I think journalists now go in with a hypothesis, I believe X, and then we've made it very easy to cherry pick examples of where that hypothesis is true. So we could say, I believe X, and here's an example, and here's another example, and another example, I'm done. So in fact, we've made the articles look much stronger towards the point of view that the journalists have, rather than providing, here's all the data, let's look at it and decide what the right conclusion is. So the same thing is true. So this notion of inductive bias and such things and, and cherry picking and such is very problematic. And I think it's extremely problematic to society. Your book mentioned confirmation bias, right? confirmation bias. You just cherry picks the facts that you know, confirm you. <laughs> right, that's true. So I urge you all to be much more critical readers than you would have ever thought you need to be. And I, I don't know what to do. I subscribe to newspapers on the political right and the political left. I, and I, I also, my general going in thought is I trust essentially nothing that comes out of the world of advice on what to eat. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Alfred. It was a fantastic, fantastic lecture. Um, uh, I encourage everyone to check the Alfred's website, datascienceincontext.com. Yeah. Uh, check out the book, and you can get the PDF file, so you can read the book, plus the numerous articles that you can find there. Right. And you can find our biases, which are probably in the book as well. But we uh, we tried to be balanced. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Alfred. Bye, -bye. and Min, Min. Thank you, and good luck with your own book that's coming out in the fall. I believe is what I read although it's pre-orderable now, if you're interested in finance and data science. And I thank you for the opportunity, all of you to listen, for listening, and thank you for listening to me. Okay, thank you, Alfred. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.